All right, hi everyone. I'm here to talk to you uh, about our next topic. And so this is um, about support, protection, and movement. And your book sticks these together in the same chapter. Um, I don't know if there's necessarily a logical reason to put these topics together um, other than the book does it, so we're gonna do it. So no big deal. Right? And really, I just got a couple things that I want to talk to you about. Um, first, we're going to talk about integument, or outer coverings. And then we're going to talk about muscles, and how muscles work. So, like I said, this I, I can't think of a good logical reason why these two things go together, but um, we'll go with the flow. Alright? So again, the integument is the outer covering. And so, there are a myriad of these, right? Skin, hair, feathers, scales, horns, all those things on the outside. Um, and so we have lots of examples of this and we're just gonna just give a couple of specific examples. First off we could talk about invertebrates. Invertebrates have an epidermis and the epidermis secretes a cuticle. Well the epidermis is a skin layer that's common to lots of animals but specifically in the invertebrates it's the epidermis that secretes the cuticle and so if we look at our phylogenetic tree from lab you can see that this group of organisms that's indicated on this tree here this is a group that has an exoskeleton and that exoskeleton is shed unlike the the previous groups the other groups we talk about in lab and so that's kind of a shared derived characteristic that binds this group together. And so here's figure from your book. We're in chapter 29, by the way. And it kind of shows you a rough idea of what this cuticle looks like. And so you've got the epicuticle, which is the outer layer. It's very tough. And well, the whole thing is very tough, but it's waterproof. Then the procuticle and then you see the epidermis, okay? And so it's the procuticle and the epicuticle that together make what we call the, the cuticle or the exoskeleton. Um, so now that cuticle is made, is, is what we call acellular. It's not made of cells. So there aren't cuticle cells, right? It's secreted by the cells. And so this is something that we'll talk about in lots of animals. We've already kind of talked about a little bit. Like if you think about, you know, a mollusk shell or something like that or this cuticle it's not living tissue it's not made of cells but it's something that's secreted by the cells now what cells are we talking about in this example that's the epidermis those cells that make up that outer layer of the skin and uh, like I said the epicuticle that's waterproof and the procuticle is mostly made of chitin. So you remember when we talked about carbohydrates and structural carbohydrates, and we said chitin was a very tough, lightweight structural carbohydrate. And so this is where it's used. And it's a, you know, it's an important characteristic. Again, that whole group shares this characteristic because it's a, it's a great um, step in evolution. You've got this very tough covering that's also very lightweight, um, that's a huge advantage. And so you can evolve things like, you know, insects can fly now because they, they don't, you know, it's, it's a very light covering, but it's still tough. And that's what I'm saying here on, on one part, one box of this, you know, the cuticle is really tough and strong, but it's lightweight. Now, the downside of that is, what do you do when you grow? right you've got this tough outer covering but you need to grow well when that's when you're ready to grow the organism releases enzymes from the epidermis that digest that procuticle remember it's made of chitin so you've got enzymes that that digest that and then they reabsorb those molecules and then you've got just sort of the epicuticle you sort of just got that outer shell that's left and that just um, uh, disintegrates or the organism crawls out of it, right? And so you've seen the, the exoskeletons of locusts on trees and things like that. And so n 
you know, for a short period, the organism doesn't have that tough covering and they can grow and then secrete a new cuticle and that's what molting is. And so you digest the old cuticle, but instead of getting rid of it, you know, it makes sense to reabsorb those. You can reuse those molecules. You don't want to waste that energy. Then you just sort of get rid of that leftover part, grow, and then secrete uh, a new exoskeleton. And so that's what molting is. And so, um, you know, that, that period of time when you don't have that exoskeleton, um, that's a vulnerable time for these organisms. But, you know, they have several ways to try to uh, compensate for that. Okay, so that was just an example from invertebrates. Invertebrates, we also have an epidermis. Um, and it's also the outermost layer. It's thin. And you have the dermis as well, um, and that's a thicker inner layer. And a big difference between these two is that the dermis has a blood supply and the epidermis doesn't have a blood supply. Now the epidermis can become keratinized. And so keratin is a tough structural protein, if you remember. And those epidermal cells can produce keratin, which makes them tough and you can get things like fingernails or, or uh, uh, calluses on your hands or on your feet and so that's one way to make the outer cover tough the dermis can create tough structures too, hard bony structures and so the the bony structures are very hard and they can be created because that dermis has a blood supply right so with the blood supply you can create bone and so it's through combinations of these that you can get hard outer parts or hard parts of the integument that are sometimes necessary. Uh, so here's an example of something that doesn't have hard parts. This would be an amphibian and you can see the thin epidermal layer on the outside and then the dermal layers more inside. And you can see the blood vessels that are supplying the dermis but not the epidermis. Then of course also throughout the dermal and epidermal layers, you see different sorts of glands and things that different organisms have that give them their, their different properties. So you know, here they're showing you mucus gland, um, which helps create a, you know, a covering on the amphibian to help, um, you know, uh, keeps bacteria out, helps to keep them wet, you know, moist, keeps them from drying out. You've got the poison gland, right? So if you've got toads and things that that uh, that's one of their defenses so you can see that kind of stuff embedded in these layers here's a you know this is i'm sure a human um uh integument here and again you see the thin epidermis and then the dermis and then you know in the dermis you can see the blood vessels that supply it but you also see lots of things studded throughout the layers here right you can see nerve cells right uh you can see hair follicles that point that poke through uh, sebaceous or sweat glands um, uh, sweat glands and sebaceous glands sebaceous glands are the oil glands um, but again you've got that same organization the epidermis outside the dermis then these different layers can lead to different structures and so you are familiar that fish have scales and lots of reptiles have scales and again this is one of those things that first blush you think oh is that a synapomorphy is that a shared derived characteristic they both have scales but then you look at the origin of those scales and you see that that the scales come from the dermis in fish but from the epidermis in reptiles and so that tells you that they probably have a different origin they're from a different ancestor and that we're going to have probably different properties However, in reptiles, the really hard stuff, like the uh, turtle shells or crocodile armor, well, you know, that, that's got to be really hard, and so that's bony, and so that comes from the dermal layer. So here's a figure from your book showing how these different layers can combine to form different structures, um, and again, different kind of harder structures in the integument. And so if you, I'm going to start on the right here, like at the goat's horn, and you can see that it's, you know, the inner part is very heavy, 
strong bone coming from the dermal layer, but it's also got a very thick layer of keratinized epidermis. And so you've got both keratin and bone, so you make a very hard structure, right? And again, you see the relationship of the layers. You've got the, the vascular layer of dermis, so vascular means it's got blood. Um, then outside that, you've got the uh, uh, germinative epidermis. Germinative means, you know, it's growing, it can germinate new cells. And then you've got the keratinized epidermis. And so that's epidermis that has got the keratin that makes it hard. In the middle, you're looking at a bird's beak. Again, a very hard structure. And the base of it is, again, bone from the dermal layer. And then you've got um, a thinner layer but you st of, of keratinized epidermis, but you still have that keratin adding to the strength of that structure. And then the, on the far left, you've got, you know, it looks like a, a dog's claw or something. And, um, and you can see the relative thickness of these, and so that dog's claw doesn't have the bone that goes as far, but you notice uh, in here you've got that very thick um, vascular dermis layer, and then you've got the keratin that makes the claw. Um, I imagine this is probably, you know, that this is what they call the quick, and, uh, and, you know, if you trim your puppy dog's nails, sometimes you, you, if you trim it too far, uh, they bleed and, and they yelp, you know, because you got the quick. Well, that's it. you've got that extra, th that extra thick layer of dermis that's got those blood vessels in it, and so that's what you're hitting. So you got to be careful about that when you trim your puppy's nails. And so, again, this figure is just showing how you can combine these things to make different hard structures. Okay, another thing we want to talk about when we're talking about integument is coloration. Of course, coloration is going to be very important to a lot of animals. And so there's different ways that you can get color in your integument. So for example, we can talk about structural color. And so this is color that doesn't come from a pigment. When you think about color, you tend to think about pigments, you know, like if you paint something, you got pigments and things that have a color already. This is different. This is the structure of the integument absorbs and reflects certain wavelengths of light, and that's what gives the organism color. So they don't produce any pigment in this example. They produce things that are shaped in such a way that certain wavelengths are reflected. So a classic example is an indigo bunting or actually any kind of blue bird, bird that's got blue coloring, they don't produce a blue pigment. So this is a brilliantly blue, beautiful bird, right? Um, but it's not due to pigment. It's because the feathers are shaped in such a way that they absorb other wavelengths of light, but they reflect those blue wavelengths. And that's what gives them this brilliant blue color. Now, of course, there are lots of coloration that, that are also due to pigments. And, um, <clears throat> excuse me, and so many organisms, you know, probably most organisms do their color in this manner, where you've got these cells called chromatophores that are in um, the, uh, probably the dermal layer, maybe some in the epidermis. But these are specialized cells that contain pigments that give organisms their color. And so here's a figure from your book. And they're showing these cells to have these kind of crazy shapes, and that's probably accurate. And um, the top is just an example of a uh, crustacean chromatophore, and the bottom is a cephalopod. Um, but they both contain pigments. One of the things they're trying to show you here is that the pigment can move throughout the chromatophore. And so on the left, in both of these examples, the pigment is dispersed, and so it's spread throughout the entire chromatophore. And that gives the animal intense color. If all this pigment, you know, remember these are cells, so these are very small, but you got a bunch of these, but if that pigment is spread throughout all the cells, that gives the organism intense color. Whereas on the right, they're showing that you can take that pigment and, and contract it and concentrate it so it's not as spread out, and that gives less vibrant color, or that gives them a washed out look. And so by moving this pigment throughout the chromatophore, you can change the intensity of the color, which means that you can change color. And so this is how organisms can change color. 
is by moving this pigment throughout the cell. And so if you look at things like cephalopods, these you know, chromatophores are, there are special organs and muscles that can control this. And so this can happen very rapidly. In lots of organisms, it's controlled by nerves. And so it's pretty rapid, but cephalopods, it's extraordinarily rapid. But by just moving this pigment, you know, either dispersing it in the chromatophore or concentrating it, that's what you can do to change color. And so this is where you can get these interesting things like chameleons or squid or things that, that can change color very rapidly to match their background. Well, this is how they're doing it. They've got different chromatophores with different pigments and they can control how dispersed the pigment is in each of those chromatophores and by combining them you can get these different colors but you can get these different color changes very rapidly and so like i said there's different chromatophores that have different pigments and so we tend to group them based upon the color of the pigment that they contain and so um, there are pigments called melanins that are the blacks and the browns, and those are in melanophores. Um, so that's a subset of chromatophore. Then you've got uh, other pigments that are called keratinoids. You don't think of a carrot, right? Yellows and reds. Those pigments are in uh, cells called xanthophores. Again, it's a subset of chromatophore. And I think there's probably other pigments, but these are the main ones here. You also have uh, iridophores which is another subset or another type of chromatophore. And these don't produce color so much as they produce flash or shininess. And so these cells don't have a pigment, they have guanine crystals. And remember guanine, it's the same guanine that we use you know, to make DNA. And again, this is a great example of how natural selection tinkers with what's there. We've already seen how, like, um, you know, we, we use guanine and adenine and, and those nucleotides to make nucleic acids that's what very important use but we've also seen how you can use adenine and add some phosphates to it and now you've got ATP which is another use so it's just taking something that's there and tinkering with it but we've also seen that you can do this with guanine too and so you can use sometimes you see GTP and here's another example of using a molecule there's a molecule that's there and natural selection selected for and tinkered with it so that you find a different use and here's a different use those guanine crystals are shiny and so if, you know if you look at fish that have kind of a flash or whatever this is how they're getting it the backs of the eyeballs that shine when you put a flashlight on them in a lot of mammals this is how you get that shininess and so sometimes you have organisms that um, don't produce, you know, there's a mutation, and so they either don't produce certain pigments, or they produce them, but they're not laid down properly, or there's something wrong with certain types of chromatophores, and so this is where you get uh, unique coloration patterns. And so, for example, here's an ex uh, a squirrel showing melanism, where they're only producing uh, the melanins. They're only producing the dark pigments and not other pigments, and so you get this beautiful black squirrel that's atypical. Uh, here's xanthochromism, where you're producing just the xanthophore, the, the xanthic pigments, you know, the yellows, or just the yellows but not the reds, right? So here's a cardinal that sh you typically produces lots of brilliant red pigment, but it's only producing yellow pigment. And so that's what's happening, is that you you're having a mutation that causes it to not produce uh, the right pigments or not doesn't produce the the right cells that have those pigments or whatever and so that's how you can get kind of unique coloration but of course by combining all these different chromatophores you can get all the different brilliant coloration that you see out there in nature okay so that's the first part of of this talk um, integument and i'll be back with some more stuff later so let me know if you got any questions. See ya.